our first panel. This panel is around supply chain, and I'll have that panel introduced by the moderator, and I'll just spend just a quick second here in introducing you. Uh, I would need more than a second to really for, truly do you justice, but Kieran Mazumder Shah is really one of the most remarkable innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the world, founder of one of the great Indian biotechnology groups, Biocon. And if you look at a top X list, whether that's top three, top five, top 10, or top 100, whether it's Time Magazine, whether it's Forbes, you fill in the blank, you will always find Kieran Mazumder Shah's name on that list. Kieran, I will hand it over to you to introduce the, the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for those very kind words. We have a remarkable panel today, and I won't dwell too much on introducing the panel because I think uh, we want to really get uh, in, into the discussions very rapidly. So let me say that it's such a pleasure to moderate a panel that has the likes of uh, Amitabh Kant, who is a, a remarkable bureaucrat. I've had the pleasure of working with him on several policy matters. And Amitabh is today uh, the G20 Sherpa uh, under the presidency of India uh, for the G20 this year. Uh, Amitabh, of course, is someone who is really a great proponent of what India can do for the world. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Krishna Ella who is one of the vaccine pioneers in India, and I'm sure he will have a lot to say. We have uh, Sanat Chattopadhyay, another uh, very well-known uh, face in India, who I'm sure will have a lot to say in terms of uh, what India can do in terms of uh, being a part of, the, uh, of rebuilding the global supply chain. And we also have, uh, you know, the participation of two very important people, my good friend, Chris Wierbacher, uh, who, of course, is someone who, with whom I worked very closely um, at uh, RDMIC, which was a WHO, uh, you know, initiative during the pandemic to look at global supply chains, access and planning. So I think that and, and Chris did a remarkable job pulling it all together. Uh, he is a great leader. He is someone who has been sought after in terms of his leadership roles, and he's recently taken over at the helm of, of course, Biogen. And then finally, last but not least, we have Une-san, who of course knows not just India and Japan very well, but someone who's played a remarkable role in healthcare and understanding what the world needs to do in terms of global healthcare. So without further, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, delay, I would like to now jump into this panel discussion. And maybe I'll start by, you know, alluding to what happened during the COVID pandemic, which really exposed the fragility and fragmentation of global supply chains. And as we all know, this resulted in denying vaccines to many parts of the waiting world. Um, the lessons learned obviously call for rebuilding interconnected, resilient, and robust global supply chains that deliver both access and global reach. Um, and I think this has to be done through sort of uh, uh, global distributed networks. Uh, I think, uh, I'm sure we all agree that technology will obviously play a key role to ensure that drugs, vaccines, medical devices, and medical services are both omnipresent and ex efficiently delivered. Um, as you know, um, India did a remarkable job of using digital platforms to immunize its entire population of over a billion people. And we all understand the power of technology. And I think it will be very interesting to see how we use technology to answer these healthcare challenges of today and tomorrow. So let me start with you, uh, Amitabh Kant. As the G20 Sherpa under India's presidency, you have been an advocate for health security and health equity through academic and industry collaborations across the healthcare ecosystem from research to manufacturing. Can you share your thoughts on the G20 vision to build agile and adaptable global supply chains that can cope with health challenges and health crises? And of course, more importantly, I'm sure you will refer to India's role in doing all of that. 
over uh, to you amita yeah uh, so uh, kiran as you rightly said you know we've uh, we've had the worst uh, global health crisis in a century and although uh, partnerships and national efforts somewhat blunted the severity of supply chain disruptions during the pandemic the effort to develop a global pandemic preparedness system uh, i think has yet to gain a full momentum and you know we need sustained political will and investment needed to ensure that the global healthcare supply chain can effectively respond to a future crisis and this is important and uh, you know the good news is that we've learned a lot in the past two decades Uh, you know before the covid with sars and ebola uh, but it'll, it'll take a lot more to create a more resilient and secure global healthcare supply chain and to my mind this will require a lot of political will and sustained financing over a long period of time uh, so that uh, it we look at funding should not dry up as memories fade and as priorities shift because the crisis of this nature arises once in a lifetime secondly uh, there is a need for <laughs> geographical diversification of manufacturing in different regions uh, thirdly there is a need for improved stockpiles and inventory management there is also a need for platform for data sharing and much greater enhanced transparency which was lacking uh, i think information sharing across public and private partners requires huge amount of effort and then there is a need for fostering the free flow of goods uh, during the covid period we saw government restrict several governments restriction on exports played a significant role in actually worsening product distribution shortages and therefore fostering free flow of goods is important there is a need for coordinated early warning system for outbreaks and uh, there is ultimately there is to my mind a very very huge focus which we all need to lay on strengthening health systems and better primary care for the future uh, all this is very very critical uh, in g20 uh, we put this at the heart of our uh, the challenge and uh, the g20 uh, countries really feel uh, during our presidency really feel that in focusing in all those areas uh, health emergencies prevention preparedness and response is the priority number 1 uh, the g20 members are sharing responsibility of providing health security to citizens we and that we need to encourage and promote innovation global partnerships and knowledge sharing amongst the global scientific community this is really the key to my mind and that is what we've laid a massive focus on the pandemic has demonstrated the need for global collaboration and partnership in drug in vaccine development climate research and health data analytics to provide solutions we in during the covid we could do it at fast pace uh, you know at massive uh, pace uh, we could do this in india we one of the leading persons who dis, who was able to innovate as a part of our panel here mr krishnaella but we need to continuously see that this enhances this ability to deliver at a faster pace constantly improves so these are the key areas which the g20 is focusing on global collaboration as the key area uh, for future pandemics is an absolute must which the g20 is focusing on thank you amitabh let me bring in my good friend chris weebacher into this discussion because i think chris is someone who has deep insights into how to build these uh, global supply chains for the future and i know he's uh, you know had a very deep understanding from what from the role he played during the pandemic but i think we need to go beyond the pandemic and who better than chris to share his thoughts on how we look at global healthcare and you know how do we deal with these global supply chains of the future um so over to you chris thank you kieran um yeah i mean as part of the the covax initiative in rdmic we actually did a retroactive uh, study of of what worked and what didn't um and and they i think some of those can be applied to to more than the uh, the pandemic you know you you can look at it at a micro level and 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 at a, a macro level at the micro level 
you know, there is a need to, to not only think about the finished product, but one of the things that we had to do was think about the end to end supply chain. So for instance, stoppers and, and glass and syringes, um, and actually, that's where we needed a coordinating body like the RDMIC. We didn't know which vaccines were actually going to, to work, but we, we needed to put orders in to Corning for medical glass. We needed to find stoppers, and then we, we could help allocate that supply later. One of the things that came out, though, was um, we really need a lot more standardization. So if I think this on a, on a more macro level, you know, we don't have a single assay for antibodies. There are three. Uh, there are two assay T cells, and they give dramatically different results between them. Um, if you use one of them consistently, it's it's fine, but it made it very difficult to compare vaccines. Um, we need regulatory harmonization. Uh, you, you know, we had a, a situation where the AstraZeneca vaccine was deemed to be safe by the uh, European Medicines Agency, but then Denmark decided that it wasn't, um, and and that caused an awful lot of concern around. Um, the safety and, and confidence in vaccines in general, because regulatory agencies were saying different things. So we can we can get supply, but we can undermine that if we don't have regulatory uh, harmonization. Uh, Amitabh spoke about the export controls. Um, you know, my personal view is is that it's always going to be politically difficult for a government to start exporting a finished product until the domestic population is vaccinated. But there are two things that I think we can do. One is we have to make sure we're not having export controls on the components of this because that's, that can actually hurt all countries together. And, and the second thing is, uh, to the point of capacity, we probably need to put more vaccine capacity in countries with moderate-sized domestic populations so that they can vaccinate those populations quickly and then start exporting. So think Korea, think Australia, think Canada. Um, they, they can get that through their domestic population and then uh, release that capacity. Mapping of capacity is important. Remember, vaccine factories and, and even for antibodies and other things, they're not sitting around empty. And so one of the things that we found we had to do was cobble together supply chains, not just of, of components, but for instance, well, we needed sterile fill and finish capacity. And where could we find that? And that might be a different place in where we're producing the active ingredient. And having that mapped out in advance um, would, would actually speed up the process because I think at some point we actually had a vaccine approved faster than we could actually get all the supply chains to, to get it up and running. So I think some of these things um, you know, need, can be coordinated. Some of them are going to be more politically difficult, but I think some of them could actually be managed by... WHO and, and other agencies down below. Thanks, Chris. I think uh, your, uh, you know, your, your comments on uh, regulatory harmonization and uh, capacity mapping uh, are well taken. And I think, uh, you know, we need to really focus on these kind of uh, various uh, capacity requirements. And uh, I think we also um, ought to look at how we, uh, you know, stockpile many of these very key essential medicines. As you know, even in the U.S. today, they are talking about drug shortages. And I think we need to really map out inventory across the world so that we are not found lacking in terms of, you know, dealing with uh, healthcare, whether it's, uh, you know, communicable diseases or non-communicable diseases for that matter. Because as you know, chronic diseases and acute for that matter, if they are short of drugs, that's a serious kind of, uh, uh, you know, neg neglect of healthcare. So thanks, Chris, uh, for your very, very valuable comments as ever. Um, I would now like to turn to Krishna Ella, uh, who was recently decorated with uh, one of the highest national honors in India for playing a very key role in developing vaccines in a timely manner during the pandemic. Uh, Krishna, I'd like you to talk about the importance of collaboration, both with the government and academic institutions. I think you're one person who's played a very important role in that part of innovation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, you know, what's important is, uh, you know, I'm a true believer of public-private partnership because it brings uh, the idea and the execution of the project. And two combined. And uh, we have done it with the rotavirus vaccine, CDC, Stanford, you know, NIH. We've done the rotavirus. 
Bifurcate conjugate we have done with the Gate Foundation and all the UK institutes and US institutes, all of them we have done in a more than five billion dollars. I'm a two billion. So this also brings to a point why public private partnership is also important. So when we were talking earlier, uh, one of the speech I heard the clinical trial, you know, expansion of the scaling up the clinical trial in India. Truly, the public private partnership is one way of scaling up the uh, and I think, you know, uh, what is important is now the COVID, we were talking about the uh, capacities and all that. Now, the question is now what we are going to face now globally, post-COVID, excess capacity defense. Excess capacity available. Now, how do you sustain them? So I think we are seeing all in India, the people who started now gone into trouble. And that is happening in all of us. So I think, you know, the question is the collaboration I think the government of India has done, and the even US government has done, all the government different. If you look at it globally, all the government actively involved in containing the pandemic with the industries, all of them, irrespective of all the government. So that is a phenomenal job the government has done. But what is important, the public partnership is a very critical. Look at, uh, you know, Modern has done with the NIH collaboration. Okay. I mean, like everyone, the AstraZeneca is a Oxford. So uh, Covaxin, with ICMR. So every one, one way or other, is a power. You look at the Chinese also with the defense institutes there. So I think it is a public partnership is the one way to go about the containing of COVID, any pandemic in the future. Two bullet points I want to make in the end. One of them is the all neglected disease are only in, in, in the Asia and Africa. And today, all neglected disease, what it turns into pandemic. So the capacity building is a much more crucial and collaboration is much more uh, crucial in Asia and Africa, because that is where the starts of the pandemic. So I think that's a very critical I think people should look at it that in different directions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Krishna. I think you make a very important point about uh, neglected diseases and you know certain geographies which really are need uh, need a lot of urgent attention and focus when it comes to these uh, outbreaks. Uh, let me now bring in uh, Une-san. Um, you know, Une-san has uh, been someone who has played a role in India and understands, uh, you know, global health care in, in many, many ways. Uh, uh, maybe I would like to basically ask him a very pertinent question. You know, he hails from Japan and we know that demographics play a key role in health care. Uh, you know, Aging populations' needs are very different to young populations' needs, like in India. And as as Krishna just said, you know the the uh, you know the the presence of or the incidence and of uh, neglected diseases in many geographies also calls for a very different handling of global healthcare needs. And yet, there are key synergies, especially when it comes to whether all kinds of diseases. And uh, is there something that uh, we can basically leverage uh, in terms of partnerships and collaborations to cover this whole ambit of uh, the disease burden that we see across the world? So I'd like to have your comments, Unesan, on how do we basically leverage capabilities, resources uh, to address uh, the needs of the world? I mean, you know, whether it's uh, demographics, whether it's diseases, how do we do this? Thank you. What I can say is that, you know, once again, we should go back to uh, very old questions. As a matter of fact, as you may know, only several countries could create and launch innovative product. Only several countries. And on the other hand, nowadays, Many startups and academia brought in uh, innovative idea or technologies or pharmaceutical seeds. And so that it's really, once again, the time to establish substantial yet flexible bridging between established and startup companies or academia. Once again, while this is very old questions, and always asked in Japan too. G20 
under Indian presidency after COVID-19 looks the best opportunity and the timing to set up the real, real good substantial action plans beyond the corporate basis. So Indian cabinet or government should take a good leader tips and provide forward-looking statement after G20 meeting. I think this is always struggling every part of the world, including Japan, but how substantially achieved? I think there are three important elements once again to overcome this leadership and the structure, and finally, financial support. So the people here can provide some good idea to Indian government to set up some basis how to do this. This is a little different from what you asked, but how to collaborate amongst established companies and the startups. There is opportunity here, G20. So I hope some good um, groups or delegations are organized and rotating to several companies, uh, countries upon a regular basis for next two or three years and exchange the idea and pick up an idea and do some experiments together and continue plus or minus anyway, continue next two or three years. And once even a small part could be successful, then it's a good seize of G20, bio, 20, oh, bio pharma G20 consortium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Unisan. And now finally, let me come to Sanat Chattopadhyay, who actually plays a very key role as the manufacturing uh, guru or head of Merck Manufacturing. And I think, uh, Sanat, we would love to hear your views on building these very robust and resilient uh, global supply chains of the future. Merck has played a very, very important role, even in leveraging capabilities in countries like India. And I would love to hear your views on how we go about, uh, you know, building these kind of distributed uh, supply chains that ensure supply of important essential medicines, vaccines, and other medical needs in a timely manner. Over to you, Sanat. Sanat? The mute? Is Sun I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. As as Chris very nicely articulated, uh, the whole concept of a robust global supply chain is going to involve multifaceted aspects because you're talking about three thousand different components getting sourced from three hundred different vendors and sources where standardization is very difficult. It always is platform dependent, you know, be it assay, be it components, be it the process of manufacture. So it's, it's a very daunting task. So one of, the, one of the minimum things that we have to do is really to understand that be it single use components, be it those scarce items, which could really be a shortage uh, when, when you have these kind of pandemics, what, is a best way to have a much, much more well-regulated way of dividing up these suppliers so that there's an equitable distribution. Now it's easier said than done, but that needs to be thought through in a much better way. But there's another topic, and, and Krishna and I often talk about it, is how to look at the next generation platforms for infectious and non-infectious diseases, which could create a very different kind of a supply chain and possibility of looking at many of these things differently. We, we all know that 
when it comes to vaccines, they are, you know, of many different areas where you can talk, you know, you're talking about inactivated, toxoids, live attenuated, VLPs, synthetic peptides, polysaccharides, you know, the glycoconjugates, viral vector, nuclear acids, all of those and bacterial vectors, synthetic antigen. But, but the point is that we have reached a point right now where we need to understand, is there a better way to look at the future platforms? And I think the pandemic has helped us to look at this very differently than in the past. I think there's going to be a lot more focus on the, the getting away from the conventional vaccines, which are time consuming to produce, which involve a greater risk of reversion to virulence, which need a lot more customized development against emerging and rapidly evolving pathogens. So, so my sense is that you will see a lot more bacterial vector vaccines where live bacterial cells will be used as carriers and they have already emerged as an integrating approach to produce novel vaccines with promising results. The genetic engineering techniques are going to enable the identification and deletion of critical bacterial virulence genes, and they will allow attenuation of dangerous bacteria, you know, be it uh, Yersinia bisitis and all of those. I'll also like to guess that the viral vector vaccines are going to be used. And, you know, when, when, when we used the viral vector vaccine VSB to produce Ebola, uh, it took me and my R&D head about five years by the time we came out with the Ebola vaccine. And that we considered as in the journey of Merck, which has produced many, many vaccines in the last hundred years, the fastest ever Ebola. But now we see uh, during the time of, 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 the, of the pandemic, a much speedier way of, of creating vaccines. So therefore the question is, can we do synthetic DNA vaccines? And I know that there's been a lot of attempt in HIV, Ebola, HPV, Zika, and I know that there's not been enough amount of success as yet, but that uh, maybe because of not being able to generous, generate robust B and T cell responses, but I'm quite sure they will come. The mRNA-based vaccines also are going to take us to a different place. And, and, and though, of course, the whole concept is more than three decades, uh, you know, kind of old, but the advancements that have taken place, uh, you know, both for conventional mRNA, self-amplifying mRNA, tans-amplifying mRNA, circular RNA, RNA, all these things are going to go there. So, so when you're talking about robustness of supply chain, we have to look at the meaning of the word robustness, not uh, dealing to the different next generation platforms that can be used and then try to understand what can be done to make them thermally stable so that they are able to be used and accessed in the low and middle income countries. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Sanat. That those are very, very important comments that you made. And maybe with the little time we've got left, I'd like to sort of ask the key panelists, starting with you, Sanat, you made a very important point, And that is, how do we basically leverage new platform technologies that rapidly develop some of these products and take them to the market from start to finish? And so these end-to-end -end supply chains uh, from discovery to market is going to be extremely critical. And there, I think regulations also have to play a very important role in ensuring these accelerated kind of pathways. We saw that happening in COVID, you know, where we had emergency use authorizations and we saw many of these models effectively delivered. How do we uh, basically take advantage of all that we did during COVID and translate them into today's, uh, you know, uh, requirements. Um, and moreover, I think, uh, you know, in the past, I think people like Amitabh have also made reference to real world evidence. How do we share real world evidence and take advantage of creating these global supply chains? Any thoughts on that? Well, at, the, at, at a high elevation, you know, uh, It's very difficult for any regulatory authority to be able to take decision if really there's not enough data. So that's a given. So therefore, if your phase three is uh, not adequately powered, then it just becomes difficult. And if it's a pediatric vaccine, it's even more difficult. So given all those 
all those limitations, I'm not necessarily advocating that there's a shortcut to success here. But I do believe that there is an opportunity for the regulatory authorities to look at post-approval expectations so that from a customer perspective, you can get to a different paradigm of speed to market. And yet with the post-approval commitments that all the manufacturers can make, you can definitely make sure that from a safety perspective, you're not necessarily, you know, kind of uh, not doing the right thing as a regulator. The, the other thing, uh, as, as Chris was rightly pointing out, is there a scope of standardization of components and test methods so that it's easier for the different countries to speed up? I, 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 I know that, that monopiravir was, was, was a very interesting case for Merck where we, 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 we were developing this product and, and then we realized that at that point of time, there was a very, very strong pandemic going on in India and we gave uh, uh, six or seven uh, voluntary licenses to Indian manufacturers uh, with the expectation that regardless of where the FDA process is, uh, the Drugs Control of India will be able to take full advantage of all the technology that we are giving away so that it's, 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 it's done faster and faster meaning it should be able to be launched in India much before it gets launched in US. And, 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 and we told whatever information is needed, uh, we are ready to give to the, to the DCGI. And, and, and of course, though, the, though in real life, the, the, the launch did take place after the US FDA approval, but, but we were clear that we don't have to necessarily, you know, uh, conduct the clinical trials in a manner where we will be slowing down what can happen in India. So, so all I'm trying to say is that you, you can look at all of these things in a manner where one can be very business pragmatic and yet be able to help the countries. But at the, at the core, there are some, some certain things which, which are barriers, like the long-term stability at room temperature. If there's an over-dependence on ultra-low cold chain transport, uh, if there are you know, aspects of high reactogenicity, if there is a very narrow safety window, uh, you know, of many of these platforms. So I'm not saying that that all of these things are going to go away, but but I'm hoping that with the development of potent and biodegradable lipids and new formulations, we'll be able to overcome a lot of these shortcomings in, in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Anand. Um, Amitabh, if, uh, you know, if I could come to you for sort of your closing remarks, you've heard all these various uh, uh, discussions on this panel, which I thought were very, very pertinent. Uh, what are your kind of concluding thoughts uh, that you would like to carry to the G20, uh, you know, opportunities? So, Kiran, uh, one thing which comes out very clearly is that uh, infectious diseases uh, are a whole of society issue. Uh, you know, and the vaccine development paradigm actually has been transformed during COVID for emergencies, actually, we should never forget how remarkable the vaccine development was. You know, 326 days from genomic sequence to authorization of a COVID-19 vaccine is remarkable. Uh, you know, for the next emerging threat, we need to make things even easier, regulatory mechanism even easier so that we can do it in 75 to 100 days. But the important thing is that it's, uh, it's the equitable distribution, which will require systematic change. Uh, despite success of vaccine R&D, there has been persistent inequalities in access to the fruits of the vaccine development. And therefore, allocation is an important, uh, very, very important question. And I think that's where the role of uh, G20 comes in. And uh, the G20 has to foster a very, very uh, collaborative uh, partnership so that it is able to provide uh, health security to citizens. It, uh, you know, in moments of crisis, it should be able to encourage it, put a resource fund with the World Bank in, for future. But then, uh, you know, that's, 
that resource will keep lying. It needs to be constantly kept alive. It needs to be constantly added on. It And there has to be constant focus on uh, health emergencies, prevention, preparedness, response. It has to be a constant process of ensuring that we need to encourage and promote innovation, global partnerships, and knowledge sharing amongst uh, all the global scientific community on these issues. Uh, the other is that uh, what India did during the COVID crisis, you know, uh, through the vaccine, Maitri, the vaccine friendship, we were, we, despite our very severe phase two, uh, uh, which impacted India in the second phase, we provided over 240 million COVID-19 vaccines to more than 100 countries around the world. We demonstrated that uh, we need to help citizens across the globe to get access to vaccines during that period. We also innovated on the COVID platform uh, to uh, make vaccination process easy and transparent for healthcare providers and citizens. And that was a digital approach. And in future, I think digitization uh, ensuring that we are able to plan our vaccination strategy. All this is very critical. So I think uh, post-pandemic, G20 has to play a very key role on the need for health systems to be resilient, that can recover quickly from shocks, ensure that there is a robust supply chain network, ensure that global value chains are a dominant feature of the market that provide inclusive growth, and ensure that there are adequate, huge push to a diversified global value chain in the days to come. These are all very critical. And G20 being a, a country of both emerging and developed countries and G7, which account for 85% of the global production and about almost 80% of the global trade, have a very key and critical role to play in all this. Thanks, Amitabh. And last words from Krishna. Uh, Krishna, your concluding thoughts on, on what we've just discussed. I mean, um, the India is in a great shape, uh, G20, and uh, Ramitab Khan, you'll make sure that G20 is felt globally. You'll make sure that uh, I'm really, he's a great leader. I'm, I'm telling him, uh, we are proud of that. Um, it's not that I'm telling just to praise him, it's a fact. Okay. And number one, so what I would like to see in a G20 angle post COVID, what are things gone wrong globally in G20 countries? Reviewing that, that would be helpful to us, all of us, to the country. The number two, whether G20 can have a pandemic fund can be allocated in G20. That's purely dedicated. We can't just prepare when the pandemic comes, preparing ourselves. No, we need to have some pandemic fund. Whereas Dr. Unesan said uh, about startup, where this pandemic fund can fund some of the startups and build some of the technologies and keep ready for some of the input. And third, fourth aspect of it, how do we harmonize some regulatory system for pandemic vaccines? At least you can have not for childhood vaccines, not regular vaccination, but at least pandemic vaccines. What is a simple strategy we can build on harmonization? What type of protocol we build? We just do phase one and phase two, just approve the vaccine, keep it ready. If any industry wants to do it, let them get phase one, two, approve and keep it ready. And the important for that, how do you QC reagents? Let us identify 20 pandemic uh, problems. We identify the QC reagents and how this pandemic fund can help in building those QC quality control reagents because that is the one which takes away all our uh, strategy, both clinical trial and the manufacturing both get affected because of the QC reagent. That has to be thought about it. And I mean, what the Senate said about all the supply chain, that is all important, but he has mentioned already. And um, I think, you know, um, we, we need, um, and I think we should think about some pandemic fund because the human is over. So what is next? So next five, 10 years, you may not get in the human, but is it going to go to animals? Is it going to the human, the plants? There's another one which will not be touched yet. I mean, you look at the Irish famine in the UK, I mean, Ireland, that is how the migration happened to US. People have moved to US because of one late black disease in uh, Europe. And same thing in animal. If the animal it comes, you are going to have food security issues. So I think we need to, beyond uh, COVID, we should start looking at a different angle uh, of uh, this uh, strategy in the G20 and also the collaboration and partnership. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Krishna. So I think this has been a very, very uh, comprehensive discussion around global supply chains. I think uh, 
many many key uh, you know aspects of uh, building or rebuilding new global supply chains have surfaced uh, from uh, standardization harmonization collaboration information sharing the use of digital technologies in connecting uh, the various uh, global supply chains and of course uh, you know transparency and sharing is really at the base of all this so i really want to thank this uh, wonderful panel i think um, every one of you has made some very very pertinent points um i'm sure there's been a lot learned from this global crisis that we've all just gone through let's hope that uh, pandemic preparedness is something that we are all going to be very confident of and i know that every country has a role to play i mean that's what the this pandemic has shown us the global connectedness and you know no one is safe till everyone is safe is really the kind of mantra we've all followed and i think this has also opened up a, a huge uh, recognition of partnerships collaborations public private partnerships like uh, krishna elam alluded to but more than anything else i think this is a call for action and this is a time when various uh, forums like g20 can play a very very key role in shaping uh, global healthcare for the future so with that i'd like to thank everyone and uh, bring this panel discussion to a close thank you thank you karen thank you very much for that really informative panel like it's clear that we have got a lot of work to do and we all appreciate your your call to action so as as part of this as part of this summit we'll be engaging you the audience in uh, in polls following each of the um each of the panels and if i could bring up the first polling question please i don't know if the if the uh if we have access to the first polling question there we go all right and i'm just going to make that larger on my screen so i can see it it's going to just give me a second i'll read the polling question for everybody so if you could please um gear up and answer the following question we're very interested in hearing your feedback what would have the biggest impact on helping to mitigate the next pandemic a building more adapt adaptable global supply chains for drugs and vaccines b greater use of advanced purchasing agreements and related mechanism to encourage industry r&d or c more public private partnerships and pre-competitive industry collaborations so if you could just uh, put in your vote and we'll look forward to hearing your thoughts there of course all three very important but we'll see what the audience thinks of as the um as the most important uh, piece uh, and, and and again thanks to this panel for for highlighting an area that we often don't think enough about which is which is supply chain All right, thank you very much everybody for taking the time. Uh we gave you a double run of the Medanta video so you'd have chance to really think through the answer to this question. So let's bring up the polling results if we could so we can see them. So so great. So we see the polls are in and there's a clear winner and actually um perhaps because of the input from the panel it's building more adaptable global supply chain for drugs and vaccines with over 50% of the audience seeing that as the as the key. Um greater advanced purchasing agreements scored only about 10% and then about a third of you thought the most important element to prevent future pandemics were, were better public private partnerships so thank you very much for partic your participation in the in the poll and with that said i will hand it back to you karun for the next panel